My dear fellow workers, this is at once a frightening and an inspiring situation to be in, standing before what is estimated as about 12,000 students. It's humbling. It makes one realize how dependent he really is for guidance and humbly to seek that guidance. I've appreciated very much the singing of this wonderful chorus. It's amazing to me as I travel around the church to see how many fine choruses we have in all parts of the church. And I've been in almost all of the stakes. But I think nothing finer can be or has been given than these numbers tonight by this chorus. Of course, I don't profess to be much of a judge of music. I fear I may be a little like a couple of fellows who are sitting in the bandstand. The band was playing. Each wanted to impress the other with his knowledge of music. And one said, do you know what the band's playing? He said, well, yes, that's Tannhauser. No, it isn't. It's the second movement of Chopin. The man said, well, I'll go down and find out. He went down toward the bandstand, came back shortly, said, no, we're both wrong. That was the refrain from spitting. I saw it on the sign out there. <laughs> There's only one justification for telling a story like that on an occasion like this, and that is that the speaker needs a little tranquilizer <laughs> and to have you respond by laughter helps in a sedative way to get one's bearings. I was amused at a recent dinner that was given by someone in the Hotel Utah, I think Monday, and... Uh, one of the general authorities was telling how while he was visiting one of the stakes, stayed at the home of the stake president, a large family, and in that family, as in many LDS families, they had the habit of taking turns in offering the evening prayer. On this particular occasion, the young girl, three years old, was praying. And she prayed for the bishop and the stake president, and the general authorities, and for President McKay, who stands on his head in the church. <clears throat> How easily we can be misled <laughs> when someone tells us something that we don't quite understand. <clears throat> I do not intend to attempt to give an oration tonight. I'd like merely to talk about this and that with you as it is a fireside. I'd like to be free to depart from any text that my introductory remarks may indicate and just talk about various things as they may present themselves to our minds. As we, as students, approach life, we, of course, feel humble. At times, we indicate that we're not very humble. But I'm sure, as a general rule, the young people of the Church are humble. Humble in the sense that they seek divine guidance. And I know they try to live so as to warrant an answer to their prayers. I'm thinking now in terms of what we were, some of us nearly a hundred years ago and others of us barely 18 or 20 years ago, 
But all of us at one time were little children. We came into this world rather helpless. The encircling arms of our mothers were the only protection we had, and the only thing we knew was her love. A little later, she put us in the crib, and there, too, the pre precautions had been taken against any accident that might occur to us. We're protected and guarded. A little later, we're out of the crib and in the room, crawling on the floor, mother ever near to protect us. And then we find there are other rooms in the house, and we do a little exploring, sometimes to the discouraging attitude of our mothers. But later on, we're permitted to go out in the yard, and there, too, there are hedges and fences to restrict and restrain and protect us. And then, later, we learned to read and to write. Someone helped us across the road. We went to church and school. And from there, we found there were other towns than our own, and we went to larger cities on visits. From there, perhaps, across the ocean to other foreign countries. And perhaps some of us might have had an opportunity to fly. And some of you may have an opportunity to get into outer space. And so your, your conduct so far has been measured very largely by a process of pushing back your horizons, making inquiries, investigation, wondering, learning, studying. And that has been the process. Now, life is very much like a journey. Those of you who live in Provo or those of you who are visiting here have undoubtedly some time or other wanted to go to either New York or San Francisco in a car. Perchance you have been offered a big reward if you had arrived there. And with high ambition you've started on the journey. First, you took the occasion to seek out someone who had been over the road. You would take advice from those who know the way. You study road maps and familiarize yourselves with what perhaps may lie ahead. In other words, you prepare for the journey. And on the journey, you find there are road signs. There are flashing signs indicating sometimes danger, soft shoulders, sometimes perhaps road out of commission or a bridge out, and we, you heed those warning signs. We hope you do, and if you do not, you will find that there are rules and regulations all the way through life with warning signs to help us to avoid danger. Now, I'm wondering if you folks you young men and women who are here tonight are aware of the fact that a plan was laid out for you before you came here, a plan devised by the greatest of all beings, your Heavenly Father, a plan which had in its, in its intention your development, your growth, and that plan is founded on law. Observance to law must become a rule in your life. Any rebellion against law is an evidence of weak-mindedness. Any observance of law, willing observance, is evidence of a willingness to be led and guided and protected as we were as little children. If you started from here to, pro to New York in a car, you perhaps might have had some trouble in Denver, shall we say. Perhaps there's a blowout. Other dangerous things might happen, and you wonder whether you're going to make it. You might get discouraged and give up and quit the road and come back home. If you do, you're foolish because there's a reward waiting at the other end. 
And what you really will do is make amends, repairs, buy extra parts, learn something about the car you're driving, and then carry on. Now, in this battle of life, the car in which you travel is your own body, and you should learn all you can about it, and then keep it in good order. And you'll find there are very definite rules and regulations governing human conduct. I'm wondering if, in all of our experiences in life, we do not meet constantly the protective influences of those who love us. We said a moment ago our mothers were guarding us, protecting us, guiding us, helping us cross the road, but gradually this parental care and concern is withdrawn measurably, and we're given more freedom to do as we will. And we go from place to place with considerable freedom. And yet we're always aware of the fact that our freedom is limited by our conduct. Obedience to law is liberty, and we learn that as we go forward. Now, on this journey of life, you're not headed for New York or San Francisco. You're headed for immortality, eternal life, and eternal increase. And when I mention eternal increase, I'm referring not only to increase of posterity, but to increase of knowledge and the power that comes with knowledge when it's set on fire. I'm referring to the increase of unfolding knowledge, the increase of wisdom, which is the proper use of knowledge, the increase of intelligence, which is the glory of God and will be the glory of man and the measuring rod by which he may be determined where he's going. I think every young person should decide rather early in life where he wants to go, what he wants to be, and what he's willing to pay to achieve his ends. And in paying, there is involved some self-sacrifice, a lot of self-discipline. And if a young man or a young woman loses control of themselves in the folly of association with others, and if they lose the discipline which keeps them on the track, they are liable to lose all. I would mention then as one of the definite controlling factors of all life, self-discipline, that which a man uses when he is tempted by someone or something to do something or say something that he knows he ought not to do or say. And when he gets the courage and the stamina to say no and mean it, then he can take charge of his life and go forward. I think it's very important that we understand the meaning of self-discipline. In the Army, I learned a little about discipline, not very much, but a little. I learned enough to know that if I was told to do a thing, I'd better do it. And a number of you have learned the same thing in the Army. There are good things in the Army, as well as some things that are not so good. But discipline is one of the things that I appreciate in my military experience. Incidentally, the introduction indicated that I had been in many different activities at different times. I think that would indicate to most of you that I must be about 110 years old. <laughs> I think I'm very near that, but a little, a little time is left, I think, for some of us. I think one of the first things that every young person should do is attempt to get acquainted with God. And I mean that in a very literal sense. I mean it in the sense that he's able to go to him and obtain the kind of help that he needs. I remember when I was quite a lad, and that's remembering a long way back. I remember my mother said to me when I left to go on my mission in 1904, 
and that's before some of you were born. <laughs> she said, my boy, you're going a long ways away from me now. Do you remember, she said, that when you were a little lad, you used to have bad dreams and get frightened? She said, your bedroom was just off mine, and frequently you'd cry out in the night and say, Mother, are you there? And I'd answer, yes, my boy, I'm here. Everything's all right. Turn over and go to sleep. And she says, you always did. Knowing that I was there gave you courage. Now, she said, you'll be about 6,000 miles away. And though you may cry out for me, I cannot answer you. She added this, there is one who can. And if you call to him, he'll hear you when you call. He'll respond to your appeal. And you just say, Father, are you there? And you there will come into your heart a comfort, a solace, such as you knew as a boy when I answered you. I want to say to you, young people, that many times since then, in many and varying conditions, I have cried out, Father, are you there? I made that plea when in the mission field we were mobbed almost every night. We're driven from place to place. We were beaten, expelled from cities, threatened, our lives were threatened. And every time before I went out in those meetings, <clears throat> I'd say, Father, are you there? And though I didn't hear a voice and I didn't see his person, I want to tell you, young people, he replied to me with a comfort and assurance, a testimony of his presence that made me unafraid. And with that presence, I am grateful to say we did not suffer much. I think it important that we get acquainted with him. I wonder if I should tell a story. Sometimes I've been accused of doing that. <clears throat> I can't help it. Just like a man having fits. <laughs> when a man has fits, he's going to have one, he feels it coming on, he has it. <laughs> when I feel a story coming on, the only possible thing for me to do is to tell it. <laughs> this story has to do with an experience of my own. It has been indicated that I was asked to come down from Canada at a time when I was drilling oil wells, at a time when I thought I was almost a millionaire, a time when it looked like nothing could save us from being millionaires. <laughs> I didn't want to be saved. <laughs> and yet I had at that time, I had a sort of feeling that I wanted to know whether it was right for me to pursue the course I was taking. I awoke one morning, about three o'clock in the morning. Mornings come early up there in the summertime. I was in a little cot, cottage <clears throat> up in the Canadian Rockies. I was worried and bothered. I got out of my bed, dressed, and went up into the mountains, far back in the hills, remembering that the Savior often went to the mountains for his communications with his Father. When I got up into the mountain on top of a peak, I was all alone. I removed my hat and, in loud voice, I said, Oh God, are you there? You know that I'm about to be a millionaire, or I think I am. Father, if this is not to be good for me or my family, don't allow it to happen. If it's going to rob my family of their faith, don't allow it to happen. I talked to him as a man would talk to another man. I didn't seem to get an answer. I stayed up there for some time. 
Young people, it's a comforting thing to talk to God. I drove that evening back to Leth back to Edmonton, 170 miles, I think. And upon arriving, I said to Sister Brown, I think I'll not want any supper tonight. I think I'll go in the back bedroom and sleep. You'd better stay in the other room because I fear I'm going to have a wakeful night. I went into that bedroom, closed the door, and I was conscious of a blackness such as I had never known. There was something in that room that made me feel very sincerely that I'd like to be rubbed out. I'd like to cease to be. I didn't intend or think of suicide, but I did think seriously if there's any way that I could be washed out, that would be the best thing that could happen to me. I spent the night in that attitude, in that aura of awful blackness. Early in the morning, Sister Brown came in, heard me walking the floor. When she closed the door, she says, My goodness, my dear, what's in this room? I said, The devil is in this room, and he's trying to destroy me. Together we knelt at the bedside and prayed for guidance and deliverance. We didn't seem to get it. Next morning I went down to my office in the city. It was Saturday. I knew there would be no one there. I wanted to be alone. I knelt by my cot and pleaded to God for, for deliverance, for that awful blackness was still on my soul. And it seemed to me the sun came up. I obtained peace of soul, serenity of spirit. And I phoned Sister Brown and told her, everything's all right. I don't know what's happened, but it's all right. And that night, I was taking a bath. I told you it was Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> and we observed Saturday night up in Canada. I was having a bath. <laughs> the difference between a bath and a bath. A bath is what an Englishman takes once a week. A bath is what an American takes every day. <laughs> I was taking a bath. <laughs> the telephone rang. Sister Brown came to the door and said, Salt Lake is calling. I said, who in the dickens wants to talk to me at this time of night? It was 10.30. I went to the phone. I said, hello. <laughs> if I had known what was going to happen, I think I would reverse that salutation. I can, I can see that I've got to stop telling a story because you, <laughs> you folks are so responsive, we'll be here all night. <laughs> but when I said hello, I heard a voice. <laughs> the voice said, this is David O. McKay calling. I said, yes, President McKay. The Lord wants you to give the balance of your life to the church. This is the closing session of conference tomorrow. Can you get here in time for the afternoon session? I told him I couldn't as there were no planes flying. He says, come as soon as you can. You know, I didn't think to ask him what there was in it. I thought I would do an ordinary business deal. But I hung up. And that night, this was the night following the night of blackness in our lives. Sister Brown and I spent another wakeful night. But it was a night of bliss. Not that we were looking for a position. But to think that the God of heaven would reach out 
1,200 miles and touch a man on the shoulder and say, Come. To think that I would be that man was almost more than I could understand. I told the President when I came down 30 days later about this experience. And as far as I know, every man that's called in the general authorities has to wrestle with the devil. You have to have a lot of courage if you come off victorious. Do I know God lives? Do I know the devil lives? I want to tell you, young people, there's a constant war between the two. And the war is over you and your soul. The adversary would take you and destroy you if God would permit it. He has many devices, many means of attack, many avenues of approach, and you must be on guard. Young people throughout the world today, there's a situation unlike anything has ever happened in the world. And the situation is affecting the young people of the world adversely. And many of the young people of the world and some young people on the university campuses are taking part in activities that are not only deplorable, but they're degrading. Now I want to say to you young people of BYU, the eyes of the whole church are upon you, expecting you to stand firm, to have faith and fortitude and courage and keep yourselves absolutely clean in the center of your heart to the ends of your fingers and toes. That is the challenge I issue to you tonight. Beware of the approaches of the adversary and know always that God stands ready to help. You can call on him and he will help. Now, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to do wrong things. All of you, all of us. But the Lord has been good enough to make provision for us so that we can be forgiven of our sins. I thought I'd like to read you just a word or two about forgiveness. You know, the devil is very cunning in his approach. And when a boy or a girl has done something wrong, he whispers in their ears, now you have committed an unpardonable sin. There's no hope for you in the future. And he tells them that they might as well go on sinning because they have taken the first step and there's no turning back. I want to say to you, my young friends, that is a lie from the champion of all liars. God wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to change your course. He wants you to call for help, and he stands ready and willing to help. I trust that every man and woman here tonight will take courage in the fact that God is real, and he's as close to you as you let him be. I shall not be able to turn to the page I had in mind. In fact, I'm disregarding all the notes I took. But there's one scripture that I remember. The Lord said in the Doctrine and Covenants that he had, could not take any cognizance of wrongdoing or of sin. But he said, if the sinner will repent, I will forgive him. I wanted to leave that word of encouragement for every one of us needs to have that forgiveness. I pray that you may need it less and less as you go forward. I pray that we may be able, as young people and older ones, to so order our lives that we may keep in touch with the Master, keep in touch with the Shepherd, keep in touch with our Heavenly Father. Now, you know 
that palm trees do not grow from acorns. Only oaks come from acorns. And the reason is that somehow oaks are involved in acorns. And that which is involved can evolve. Now, young people, God is your father. In a very real and genuine sense, he's your father. And therefore, he is involved in you. And if you will conduct yourselves properly, you may evolve into something like him. But again, I say, if we yield to the temptation to do what we ought not to do and continue to yield, then we will not develop and grow and unfold into our possibilities. That which is involved can evolve, and God is involved in you. I pray you resolve tonight that you're going to evolve into something like that from which you came. I said it's a great thing to know the shepherd. Some time ago, here's another story coming on. <laughs> Some time ago, there's a great actor in the city of New York. He gave a wonderful performance. There was thunderous applause at the end of the performance. And some man in the audience thought they'd like to hear this man read. And he rose and said, Sir, would you read for us the 23rd Psalm? And the actor, being a great speaker, great elocutionist, said, Why, yes, I know the words of the 23rd Psalm. And as such a man would read, he did read that wonderful psalm. And when he finished, again there was thunderous applause. But the man arose and signaled for silence and said, I appreciate your response, but there's a man sitting down here whom I happen to know. He's an elderly man. I'd like for your benefit to have him come and really read the 23rd Psalm. The old man, of course, was frightened, but he yielded to the invitation, staggered to the stand, and read as only such a man could read the 23rd Psalm. In quavering voice, he said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And he sat down. And there was silence. There were many wiping their eyes. And the great actor arose and said, Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, I know the words of the 23rd Psalm. But this man knows the shepherd. Oh, what a difference. I pray you get acquainted with him. Be true to him, and thereby true to your parents who love you so much. Some of you are freshmen, first time away from home. There's not a day passes but what your parents connect your name with the name of God. Remember that and be worthy of their trust. Be unaffected by any association that you may have by those who have as they say, 
become somewhat sophisticated. Be unafraid to be yourself and to be your better self. I think it's a very good thing for every man to examine himself occasionally, stand himself up against the wall and look himself over, and say to him, you're an elder, a high priest, a 70, or whatever. What kind of man are you? And then answer. Remember, you're talking to yourself. And you can't deceive the man you're talking to. Nor can you deceive God. Examine yourself. Your selfish self. Your greedy self. Your amorous self. And then try and find that inner, inner self which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I pray that God will help us, that as we examine ourselves, we may be unashamed and unafraid. There's one awful thing that's happening in this world of ours today, and I'm indebted to Truman Madsen for what I'd like to read, if I may, having to do with the use of drugs. Some may think it unnecessary to mention that here. And yet I happen to know that it is making its inroads, and as I said, the adversary is doing everything in his power to get control of the minds and hearts and souls of men. And he wants the young people, because you are the future leaders of the church and of the world. And if he can defeat you, he's won a great victory. Many years ago, the great American psychologist William James, all of you students have heard of him, performed an experiment on himself. Lacking, as he believed, any solid religious experience, he set out to induce some artificially by taking nitric oxide, known as laughing gas. He came to have a series of unusual fantasies Later, he wrote a book titled The Varieties of Religious Experiences. James began and ended with a scientific curiosity. May I add in parenthesis, there are 75,000 addicts in New York who every day must have their drugs and provisions being made to meet their necessity. The nitrous oxide that James used is comparatively harmless. But many of today's drugs are lethal. James saw his trial as artificial, superficial, but in no way beneficial. I think that's a great testament coming from that type of man. Many today, both among the impoverished and the elite, profess to have been had all forms of religious experience while they were under the influence of drugs. For the life of me, I cannot understand how any sane man or woman could presume that to deaden their natural God-given senses would enable them to have a religious experience. The ecstasy of religious experience comes from a clean soul. And only as we clean up our lives and avoid the downdrag of drugs and other forms of deadening of the human intellect and soul are we going to be successful in what we undertake to do. I'd like to call your attention to what happens to a man in this church when he's converted to the truth. I hope you're all converts. I was in a meeting not long ago. And I asked how many were converts. Probably 50% raised their hands. I said, I advise the rest of you to get converted. <laughs> you need to be converts. And I'd like to say this in passing, that in the years that have passed, and they are many, I have continued to be a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And for that, I thank God. He's been good to me in that he has headed me off when I would have gone my own way. He has known better than I knew what was good for me, and he has been willing 
gracious enough to make provision for the things that he could see and I couldn't would happen to me unless he took a part and he took it. For this I am extremely grateful. I said I've had contact with him. I don't know whether this clock's right or not. You don't know what it says anyway. I can feel another story. <laughs> In 1904, I went to England on a mission. President Grant sent me down to Norwich. Norwich to you. When I got in Norwich, the president of the district sent me down to Cambridge. He said, I want you to go with Elder Downs, who was a man 45 years old. I was 21. He said, that Elder Downs will leave the morning after you get there for France because his mission is completed. There's not another Latter-day Saint within 120 miles of Cambridge, so you'll be alone. He says, you might be interested to know, Brother Brown, that the last Mormon elder that was in Cambridge was driven out by a mob at the point of a gun and was told that the next Mormon elder that stepped inside the city limits would be shot on sight. He said, I thought you'd be glad to know that. <laughs> I wasn't glad to know it, but I thought it was well that I did know it. <laughs> we went down to Norwich, Cambridge. Great signs all over the city. They'd heard we were coming. They had signs indicating their antipathy. That was their method of welcoming us. One big sign at the railway station was a large man with a long beard, a woman lying at his feet with a head on a block. Underneath it said, will you go into polygamy or won't you? That was the reception we received. Well, Elder Downs left the next morning after telling me how to fix my tracks. I went out. It was Friday morning. I tracked all morning without any response except a slammed door in my face. I tracked all afternoon with the same response. And I came home pretty well discouraged, but decided I'd track Saturday morning, although it wasn't required. And I went out and tracked all morning, and the same result. I came home dejected and downhearted, and I thought I ought to go home. I thought the Lord had made a mistake in sending me to Cambridge. I was sitting by that little alleged fire they have in England. There was a big granddaddy clock at the side of the so-called fire. I was feeling sorry for myself, and I heard a knock at the front door. The lady of the house answered the door. I heard a voice say, is there an elder Brown lives here? And I thought, oh, oh, here it is. <laughs> she said, why, yes, he's in the front room. Come in, please. He came in. He said, are you Elder Brown? I was not surprised that he was surprised. I said, yes, sir. He said, did you leave this track at my door? Well, my name and address was on it. <laughs> oh, I was attending, attempting at that time to get ready to practice law. I didn't know how to answer it. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, last Sunday there were 17 of us heads of families left the Church of England. We went to my home where I have a large room. Each of us has a large family, and we filled the large room with men, women, and children. We decided that we'd pray all through the week that the Lord would send us a new, a new pastor. When I came home tonight, I was discouraged. I thought our prayer had not been answered. But when I found this tract under my door, I knew the Lord had answered our prayer. Will you come tomorrow night and be our new pastor? No, I hadn't been in the mission field three days. <laughs> I didn't know anything about missionary work. And he wanted me to be his pastor. But I was reckless enough to say, yes, I'll come. <laughs> and I repented from then till the time of the meeting. He left took my appetite with him.
I called in the lady of the house and told her I didn't want any tea. I went up to my room. I had prepared for bed. I knelt at my bed. My young brothers and sisters, for the first time in my life, I talked with God. I told him of my predicament. I pleaded for his help. I asked him to guide me. I pleaded that he take it off, off my hands. I got up and went to bed and couldn't sleep and got out and prayed again and kept that up all night. But I really talked with God. The next morning I told the lady, landlady I didn't want breakfast and I went up among the, on the campus of Cambridge. I walked all morning and came in at noon to tell her I didn't want any lunch. And I walked all afternoon. I had a short-circuited mind. All that I could think of was I've got to go down there tonight and be a pastor. I came back to my room about six o'clock and I sat there meditating, worrying, wondering. Let me in parenthesis tell you that since that time I've had the experience of sitting beside a man who was condemned to die the next morning. As I sat and watched his emotions I was reminded of how I felt that night. I think I felt just as bad as he did. The execution time was drawing near. Finally, it came to the point where the clock said 15 minutes to 7. And I got up and put on my long Prince Albert coat, my stiff hat, which I'd acquired in Norwich, took my walking cane, which we always carried in those days, my kid gloves, put a Bible under my arm and dragged myself down to that <laughs> building, literally. I just made one track all the way. <laughs> just as I got to the gate, the man came out, a man I'd seen the night before. He bowed very politely and said, Come in, Reverend Sir. I'd never been called that before. But I went in and I saw the room was filled with people. And they all stood up to honor their new pastor. And that scared me to death. <laughs> and then I had come to the point where I began to think what I had to do. And I realized I had to say something about singing. And I suggested we sing, Oh, My Father. Well, I was met with a blank stare. We sang it. It was a terrible solo, cowboy solo. <laughs> and then I thought if I could get these people to turn around and kneel by their chairs, they wouldn't be looking at me while I pray. And I asked them if they would, and they responded readily. And they all knelt down. And I knelt down. And for the second time in my life, I talked with God. All fear left me. I didn't worry anymore. I was turning it over to him. And I said to him, among other things, I remember, Father in heaven, these folks have left the Church of England. They've come here tonight to hear the truth. You know that I'm not prepared to give them what they want. But thou art, O oh God, the one that can. And if I can be an instrument through whom you speak, very well. But please take over. <laughs> when I arose, most of them were weeping, as was I. Wisely, I dispensed with the second hymn. And I started to talk. I talked 45 minutes. I've been talking that long now. I don't know what I said. I didn't talk. God spoke through me, as subsequent events proved. 
And he spoke so powerfully to that group that at the close of the meeting they came, put their arms around me, held my hands. They said, this is what we've been waiting for. Thank God you came. I told you I dragged myself down to that meeting. On my way back home that night, I only touched ground once. <laughs> I was so elated that God had taken off my hands an insuperable task for man. Within three months, every man, woman, and child in that audience were baptized members of the church. I didn't baptize them because I was transferred. But they all joined the church, and most of them came to Utah, Idaho. I've seen some of them in recent years. They're elderly people now, but they say they never have attended such a meeting, a meeting where God spoke to them. Well, now, I have a number of things here I was going to say and haven't said any of them. What shall we do? Shall we have another meeting? <laughs> I wouldn't dare suggest it. I read the other day again from Longfellow's works in his poem called Morituri Salutamus, meaning, of course, we who are about to die salute you. That would seem to be quite appropriate tonight. We who are about to die salute you, young folks. I don't mean I'm going to die tomorrow, but I think I'll die within the next 50 years. <laughs> and within this poem, he tells a legend. Most of you students perhaps have read it. I think you're not so familiar with Longfellow as we used to be, but I like the old fellow. And he said this, and it is a description of what's happening in the world today. In medieval Rome, I know not where, there stands an image with his arm in air, and on its lifted finger, shining clear, a golden ring with a device Strike here. Greatly the people wondered, though none had guessed, the meaning that these words but half expressed, until a learned clerk, who at noonday with downcast eyes was passing on his way, paused and observed and marked it well, the spot whereon the shadow of the finger fell. Coming back at midnight, he delved and found a hidden stairway leading underground. Down this he passed into a spacious hall, lit by a flaming jewel on the wall. And opposite, in threatening attitude, with bow and shaft, a brazen statue stood. Upon his forehead like a coronet, were these mysterious words of menace set, that which I am, I am. My fatal aim, none can escape, not even yon luminous flame. Midway the hall was a fair table placed with cloth of gold and golden cups encased with rubies and the plates and knives were gold, and gold the bread and viands manifold, and around it, silent, motionless, and sad, were seated gallant knights in armor clad, and ladies beautiful with plume and zome, but they were stone. Their hearts within were stone. The vast hall was filled in every part with silent crowds, stony in face and heart. Long at the scene, bewildered and amazed, the trembling clerk in speechless wonder gazed. And then from the table, 
by his greed made bold, he seized a cup and a knife of gold. And suddenly from their seats the guests up sprang, a vaulted ceiling with loud clamors rang, and the archer sped his arrow at their call, shattering the lambent jewel on the wall. And all was dark beneath and overhead, stark on the floor, the luckless clerk lay dead. The writer of this legend records its ghastly application in these words. The image is the adversary old, whose beckoning finger points to realms of gold. Our lusts and passions are the downward stare that leads the soul from a diviner air. The archer, death. The flaming jewel, life. Terrestrial goods, the goblet and the knife. The knights and ladies, all whose flesh and bone by avarice have been hardened into stone. The clerk, the scholar, whom the love of pelf tempts from his books and from his nobler self. The scholar in the world, the endless strife, the discord in the harmonies of life, the love of learning, the sequestered nooks, and all the sweet serenity of books. In the marketplace, the eager love of gain, whose aim is vanity and whose end is pain. But why, you ask, should this tale be told to men grown old or who are growing old? It is too late. Oh, nothing is too late until the tired heart shall cease to palpitate. Cato learned Greek at 80. Then he tells of several others who did their best work after they'd reached more than four score years. And then he adds, these are indeed exceptions, but they show how far the Gulf Stream of your youth may flow into the Arctic regions of your lives where little else but life itself survives. I think we need to learn a lesson from these solemn words. The luckless clerk lay dead because of greed. I'll read another line. Wealth is not the things we own. A stately house upon a hill, paintings, rugs, and tapestries, or servants taught to do one's will. In luxury, a man may dwell as lonely as in a prison cell. Wealth is not a plenteous purse, the bonds that one has stored away, boastful bal balance in a bank, nor jeweled baubles that fools display. Things that really gratify are the things that money cannot buy. Wealth is health, a cheerful heart, an ear that hears the robin's song, a mind content, some treasured friends, and fragrant memories lingering long. Living is an inward art. All lasting wealth is in the heart. One of the things... President McKee says to all the men who are called to the Quorum of the Twelve is this. You are to become a witness of Jesus the Christ, a special witness. Wherever you go, you're to bear that witness and bless the people. My young friends, with all the solemnity of my soul, speaking from the very center of my heart, I say to you, knowing that I'm on the very brink of eternity, I say to you, Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. He is pleading for you tonight. 
his younger brothers and sisters. He is the son of the living God and he's come again in our time. And he will come again and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years of universal peace known as the millennium. That time's coming and they who are worthy by reason of their determination to avoid the down drag of life, they who are worthy will be caught up to meet him when he comes. I plead with you that you take note of every act and every word and every thought. Remember, you are the captain of your own soul. You cannot blame others who may tempt you. It's up to you. Young ladies, behave yourselves as ladies, and young men, treat them as ladies. And do not degrade one another by immoral and unrighteous actions. Heavenly Father, wilt thou bless this wonderful audience of young people. Let thy spirit be with each of them, that they may know of thy presence and be lifted up thereby, that they may keep themselves clean and pure in thy sight, that when the Savior shall come again, they may be numbered among those who are worthy to meet him at his coming. I pray for this blessing upon you, leave you this testimony, and my own special blessing, humbly, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.